Eliza, welcome back to the Walter Reed Theater. Welcome back to Film at Lincoln Center. Thank you, thank you. It's been a few years. Um, we were just talking on the walk down from the, from the lobby that, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, Eliza's film uh, won the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival this weekend. It's the Grand Jury Prize. You had an interesting few days. Um, Returning to New York just in time to return to Berlin? Yeah. As soon as I landed in New York, I got a very lovely email that said, would you please come back? <laughs> so I had to rush home and do a quick load of laundry and find a, another dress to wear and hop on a plane and head back to Berlin. And you made it back yesterday. So thank yes. you for being able to join us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We're uh, really thrilled to have you have you back here at Lincoln Center. Um, maybe um, maybe we'll just start start with an easy question, just to kind of orient us and give us a bit of context. Um, can you just kind of give us the origin story for this particular film? Uh, when did you start thinking about it and writing it? Does it, it did it all happen after your last film, Beach Rats? Did some of it happen before that? Give us some context. Yeah, I, um, I made a micro-budget feature in 2012 called It Felt Like Love. And while I was editing that movie, I took a break and I was reading a newspaper. And I was really struck by a headline that I read about the death of Savita Halepanavar in Ireland, who was refused a life-saving abortion. And I started to educate myself a little bit, and I started thinking about like where would this woman have had to have gone to save her own life. Um, and I bought a book called Ireland's Hidden Diaspora and read about the journey that women would take from Ireland across the Irish Sea to London and back in one day. And kind mm -hmm. of an, and read about like a network of women that were organized to help help women through this journey. Um, and I thought it was, you know, a really, really, you know, untold, untold story. Um, and I had an image of kind of a woman on the run. And, you know, thinking about, you know, how much persistence it must take to get through an experience like that. And also how much sort of shame and secrecy accompanies it. Um, so I originally wrote a treatment for a film set in Ireland about an Eastern European au pair who has been hired to work kind of in the countryside and she meets another au pair, young au pair, and they're both very isolated. And one of them becomes pregnant and they're forced to find a way to take this journey in a day. Um, and I, at that time I felt like, you know, I was just really making kind of localized micro-budget films in Brooklyn, kind of in my backyard. And I thought, nobody on earth is going to give me money to make this movie. Um, so I started to think about what the equivalent of that journey looks like in the United States, because obviously it's a trip that women take all over the world. And I started thinking about the journey that women take from rural areas into urban areas, and specifically New York, which has a long history of being you know, a, a safe haven for women um, seeking reproductive care. Um, and I, you know, I t decided to sort of take a little road trip and I drove to rural Pennsylvania, which is only three hours west of New York and landed in a coal mining region and, you know, walked into a local pregnancy center and said, hi, I'd like to take a pregnancy test. and. Mm -hmm sat and listened to some, you know, counselor talk to me. And when I left, she gave me a little gold bag with some homemade printed flyers. Mm. Um, and I know that was, you know, the beginning. And I ended up, you know, kind of going around Los Angeles and doing a few pitch meetings. And um, there wasn't like a lot of energy or enthusiasm for the project. And people didn't really you know, get why it was relevant. And it was, you know, under, you know, the Obama era, and there was sort of a false sense of progress. And I was like, oh no, this really happens. And I read about it and um, I put the film down. Um, I did like a European market with it and didn't get anywhere, couldn't find any co-productions. And, um, you know, after Beach Rats, my second feature premiered at Sundance, you know, you're asked a million times, like, what movie are you making next? And Trump had just been 
inaugurated and I just kept talking about this movie. So it sort of came to me um, in that moment at Sundance that this is the project that I needed to make. Congratulations. Um, let me ask you a follow-up and then I want to ask Talia a question too, but let me ask you a follow-up <laughs> to that just because you couldn't have imagined when you first started researching uh, this film, you certainly can never imagine the journey you're going to take to make the movie and then in the environment in which it's going to be hopefully someday released. Mm -hmm. um, this is such a unique moment. Uh, you know, I'll also say one thing is that you know, the BBC is involved in the movie. Yes. And I, I, after I made Beach Rats, I also went to London and I met with the BBC and they said, you know, what are you interested in? And I was like, oh, I have this movie set in Ireland. <laughs> you know, and then we talked about it and she was the head of the BBC. said, no, you should make the American version. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I sort of still sh kind of shuffled back and forth between both ideas. But then obviously the Eighth Amendment in Ireland was overturned. And yeah, the rest is history. Well, you're, you know, you're, the, the movie comes out very soon, um, next weekend from Focus Features in theaters uh, in this country. And again, you couldn't have, have imagined the environment in which it would be released and talked about. And um, certainly with not only um, what's going on in our country, but also um, in our country uh, in our, with our election coming up, but also um, the Supreme Court. Um, you couldn't have imagined certainly what, um, what a relevance this movie would have. Uh, in the moment that it's being released. Um, but I wonder no, if- People I, often ask if we like timed it and it's like, <laughs> no, it's just the unfortunate reality that we live in. But I wonder if you thought, have, have, are thinking about as you're talking about it now and, and talking about it at Sundance a couple months ago and then just, just last week in Berlin, um, if thinking about the kind of opportunity that it enables you, the, the conversation that it opens up, the conversation that it invites and allows in this particular moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the conversation that we had about the film last week is going to be different than the conversation we have about the film next week. Yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, a reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to get back to that in a minute, but actually I want to ask um, Talia, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the two of you, you and uh, Sydney Flanagan, just do such an exceptional job. Uh, maybe you can um, share with us uh, a little bit of context of your origin story with this particular film. Um, maybe from your perspective, how you got involved, the early conversations that you had with Eliza and with Sydney and with other people involved with the making of the film um, to achieve such a level of um, uh, in, in, incredible, I think, empathy and, and, and just, uh, just such a strong performance that I think just as an audience member watching it just really draws, draws you in as if you were. So maybe Thank a little you. bit of that would be. Um, it was, I think, October of last year that I first auditioned for the film. Yeah. I had m a bit more, Eliza can go into this after, I had a bit more of a traditional um, audition process than Sydney did with the film. Um, I, I went in, I read, I eventually got to... Talia's a Broadway actress. I did do Broadway before this when I was 13. And, yeah, and reading the script for the first time was really what um, solidified my want to be a part of the project. Seeing Eliza's honest, kind of raw approach to the story really was intriguing to me, and I just obviously was super passionate about the topic and wanted to be a part of telling the story, but when I got to meet Sydney for the first time, we realized that we were both from the same place. We were both from Buffalo, New York, which was a funny coincidence, but kind of, I don't know, was like the starting point of like a cool bond that we had with each other. <laughs> and it was the day that I screen tested with her. She'd already gotten the part of Autumn. We just started talking and then it was in like the rehearsal process that the two of us got really close. It can't be, uh, back to Eliza for a second, it can't be easy, well, it's not easy nowadays to make uh, an independent, an independent, independently minded film, let alone an independently funded one, um, but there's tremendous pressure on filmmakers and producers to um, cast really big names um, in high profile roles films like this. Can you talk about the, the struggle of navigating that and how you, how you per persevered in, in being able to cast the film the way you did? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I you know, came to the process 
you know, with, um, you know, kind of a conflicting approach. Like on the one hand, I'm very open-minded mm -hmm. and willing to sort of see everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, I had this feeling that it wouldn't work you know, with, you know, an actor from LA who had an LA feel, who'd done, you know, some teen Netflix show. Um, it wasn't the version of the movie that I thought would be most effective. Um, so it, that added pressure. Like, I think maybe if I had been less open-minded, um, you know, and, um, you know, stuck to my guns about the non-traditional approach to casting the movie. Um, but, you know, we did look at 200, you know, young women. Mm. Um, and we also launched this like, non-traditional search, which, which ended up kind of getting derailed. It's like we were in, in rural Pennsylvania flyering and people at like a county fair, I think, and people started reporting the flyers to the police thinking we were sex trafficking. <laughs> And it blew up kind of on the internet before mm. the film commissioner from Philadelphia was able to sort of intervene and verify the legitimacy of the project. So I had this like plan to have this other search in addition to sort of seeing who was in, in LA and it just backfired <laughs> for the first time. Um, and the, the lead actress, Sydney, I met her very informally kind of working on another film, an experimental film called Buffalo Juggalos that I was a producer on. And it was, we were shooting in South Buffalo in this kind of, you know, rough area. Um, and Sydney, I just met very briefly at a wedding, um, at like a backyard wedding. And she was just sort of sitting off to the side. And she ended up being on the periphery of this other movie we were making during the summer in 2012. And um, followed her on Facebook and kind of watched her grow up and post music. She's a musician and she would post these little videos from her bedroom that were just these like DIY rock videos of her just kind of belting out covers of kind of folk covers of punk songs. And <laughs> they were authentically teenage and just captured something sort of rough and raw and tragic about the moment and could feel she was sort of working through her own pain and anger. Um, and every time we were casting, you know, a lot of times we were casting the movie, I'd open up a video of her playing and I'd be like, we're looking for a girl like her. <laughs> mm. And then I, we, you know, were getting very close to the start date and I didn't find anyone and I wrote her on Facebook not knowing her, asking her to come audition. And she got on a plane for the first time since she's like three years old and flew to New York. And I don't know, it was a lot. It was... Um, a lot to, I think, put forward to a to bunch of producers, like, this is my movie. This is the movie I want to make with this girl. I think there was a lot of doubt, mm. um, you know, and, um, you know, I think because of the way I'd cast my other movies, I was able to establish a precedent within a contractual level that I had full approval over it. So nobody could really say no, but there was other ways in which people were expressing their fears about, you know, working with a first time performer who, you know, was, didn't really have ambitions to act. Um, when you say there was a lot of doubt, I assume you mean doubt on the part of others. How, how, how was your confidence level? Oh, I always exist in a, a, like a, a kind of constant state of anxiety and fear of failure. Um, but I, I, you know, I will say that, um, I don't know, I think, you know, casting is simple. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're just looking at tapes and you're thinking about which version of the movie you wanna watch. And for me, my intuition is supposed to guide me and tell me who's gonna bring the most depth to the role. And that's, you know, all I have to go on. Yeah. Um. Talia, let me switch gears and maybe ask you to share some insight with us um, about the filmmaking process, Eliza's filmmaking process. You talked about the bond that you and Sydney had. Um, it's so crucial to the to the performance that you're gonna that the two of you are gonna share and, and the way that we're gonna have as an audience an entry into this story. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's a bunch of different angles you could take it from, but I would I would love to hear a bit about sort of the process that that you all kind of participated in to to create this to create this story. 
Yeah, I mean, we had a very short rehearsal process. We were kind of on a time crunch. We had two days in Eliza's apartment to kind of get to know each other and get to know the script and wow. our characters. One of the things that Eliza had us do, she gave us each a journal on the first day that we met each other after the screen test and first day we were working on the project. And she wrote three very personal prompts in the journals and had Sydney and I write out answers to those and then meet with each other alone and give each other those answers. And like I said, they were very personal and I don't know, we opened up to each other really early on, which once you know like that much about a person from the start of your relationship, mm. it's really hard not to get close to that person. Mm. So yeah, that was, <laughs> I'd say the biggest part of our preparation. Oh. Yeah, I asked them to sort of write about themselves. I didn't make it so much about the characters mm -hmm. and the goal was in such a really short period of time to bond them to each other. Yeah because that's so much what the film is about and what you see on screen. Um, and then we just really went through the script and I answered questions and we you know, loosely rehearsed. Yeah. And then we did other little exercises, like I had Talia put makeup on Sydney and Sydney yeah. played us Play some music because yeah. she, she had picked the songs in the film. Uh -huh. It was just the three of us kind of sitting on a bed and hanging out. <laughs> Let me see in the minutes that we have left if we can take just a couple questions from the audience. I, I, what interested me very much in the film is the uh, um, real focus on the process of the girl outside of, outside of outside moral and ethical judgment on her, but also outside of moral and ethical judgment about the boy that she became pregnant from. And uh, so I wanted to ask you if, is, if my impression about that is your intention? Am I reading that correctly? I hope I am. Um, I think I understand. I think for me it wasn't about you know, a choice. I didn't want to make a movie about a choice or about a, you know, the you know, moral and ethical dilemma that a character might have. For me, you know, it's really a story about a young woman trying to sort of reclaim her body and her youth. And yeah, I was interested in a lot of levels to the story, you know. One of them is the procedural, you know, but it's of course not a documentary, so I didn't show everything, and I tried to filter it as much through the character's point of view and make it as subjective as possible. Um, I think certainly Planned Parenthood would have liked it if I would have shown more process right. and yeah. you know it was a balance and obviously it's so much about the relationship mm -hmm. and navigating a city that they've never been to and for me um, I felt less inclined to sort of make it about who you know who impregnated her to me was not, you know, where I wanted to focus. Mm. And, and right. for me, it was about the active journey and the active yeah. obstacles. But that's what's refreshing about it for me because the subject is ripe with politics for decades. Sorry, what? I said that's what makes it mm -hmm. uh, important for me because mm -hmm. the subject is ripe with politics mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. And um, the other thing I, I'll comment and then I'll finish is that uh, to know from a young girl's point of view that moment to moment what she is experiencing both emotionally inside herself and then also in the medical room. Thank you. I didn't, you know, I think it was a challenge because I didn't want to stigmatize the procedure for people and make it feel traumatic, but of course there, you know, is a lot of nervousness and anticipation that one would feel going into it and of course fear is part of it. So as you know, trying to be emotionally credible in what her experience would be and also not trying to sort of make it seem overly easy. Um, here in like the fifth row, we have a question. Just wait for the microphone if you don't mind. Thank you. So could you talk a little bit about her background family situation mm -hmm. that you sort of hinted at and gave us glimpses of but mm -hmm. didn't really fully develop. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about what you were trying to portray there. Yeah, I didn't want to make a family drama, you know, where, um, 
you know, somehow she's asking for her parents' acceptance and doesn't, and I didn't want to, um, yeah, I didn't, you know, it's, it's, for me it was really about the procedural and to sort of drop the audience into her world, give it a slice of life feel, and to hint at things in the atmosphere and in the characters that she's dealing with on a daily basis. And I think I can say that like, in the absence of a formal antagonist to try and establish antagonistic elements in the environment, you know, that are misogynistic and sexist and problematic that young women deal with, you know, throughout the course of the day, you know, and trying to sort of explore those micro barriers and just give you a feeling for her world and what might be wrong with it. There's a one right there, and then we'll go back. We'll look right here. The, the aspect of the clinic, uh, they're being concerned about her safety. Um, that, that, uh, it made me a little optimistic. Is that realistic? And uh, um, just could you talk is, a little bit about that? And, it and is how it works realistic. Out? Um, it is realistic. Uh, Planned Parenthood works with an organization called Haven Coalition, and it's a network of volunteers in New York City. Um, and they volunteer. Their, there's no office or anything. It's just a, just women who volunteer a couch, a meal, and an escort for women who come into the city overnight. Some clinics have relationships with hotels. So it's totally accurate. Um, you know, if I think if the film was three hours, that there's more that that social worker would have done. And her dilemma is obviously whether or not she should call Child Protective Services. Um, so there's, there's more that could have been explored. And the safety of, you know, a human being in one of those offices is a priority. There was somebody back, yes, all the way in the back. Hi, um, I just had a quick question for both of you. I know as the writer and director, I was curious if there was um, a certain scene, I mean, obviously the whole story is in, you know, it's a really tough situation, but I was curious if there was a scene while you were writing that was uh, harder than the rest, if there was a more difficult scene to write as the writer of the film. And then for you, Talia, I was curious if there was a scene that was hard for you, or the, the hardest for you to act in, because it was obviously a really, honestly, amazing performance, but I was curious if there was anything that stood out to you or that was extremely difficult. Maybe you go first, if you have one. Um, well, I mean, Eliza did a really good job of making it not feel very hard at all. Um, a lot of the scenes in New York City especially, because we were like literally in the environment that it would really take place and it like, because the world around us felt so real, it was easy to kind of put myself into the situation. Um, the scene with um, on the street with um, Jasper, Theo in real life, that one I remember was a little bit difficult finding like the balance between like like being thankful for the money, but also not thankful for the situation. Um, I mean, it's hard for me to remember, I think, sort of which scene would have been challenging to write. And, um, I think there were a lot of challenges in shooting the film logistically that are easier to sort of address. You know, I had originally like kind of written, you know, the central location as Port Authority, and it's like a microcosm for the city, and in my logic in the script, you know, they could do anything as long as it was in Port Authority. Um, and I wanted, you know, it to be a big contrast from the town that they come from, and for it to be populated with all kinds of people. And of course, like two or three weeks before we start shooting, found out we could only shoot from like 12 to 4 a.m., 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. Um, and I had to sort of scrap and revise my own ideas about what that experience was gonna feel like. But in my mind and on the page, it was much more populated. Um, and it's fine, I think those, you have to you know, adapt 
to those challenges as you go, but when you're making a movie, there's just kind of like a million of those types of obstacles that you, know, you come up against throughout the process. Um, but I don't, I don't know, yeah, I, don't, I think, yeah, for me, the challenge of the script was finding the balance you know, between the friendship and the abortion and New York and the guy and this. There were a lot of like things to juggle. Um, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always opens next week in theaters. I hope you'll uh, spread the word to your family and friends. And um, I know it's a movie that we'll be talking about for a little while going into uh, this year and probably into the fall as well. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you Thank for you. being here.